Today we're going to talk about different emotional skills that you need to successfully learn about and talk about history, politics, and other uncomfortable contentious topics with your friends, family, classmates, colleagues, etc. One of the reasons why chronological humility is really, really important is because when we're learning about things, about our past, about our country's past, about our people's past, they can there can be a lot of uncomfortable emotions that come up. And those emotions are okay. They're normal. In fact, it would be weird. It would be weird if as an American, I learned about slavery and didn't feel like unpleasant feelings about it. Um, and I want to encourage people that you can feel those feelings without letting those feelings drive your analysis of history or your politics or misapply them in overly biased ways. For example, sometimes people feel guilty about benefiting from colonization, so they become in favor of policies that would actually destabilize society, like not enforcing law and order. So for an example, maybe some people learn about colonization, and then if there's crime being committed by a particular minority group, you say, well, the crime is actually okay because of the echoes of history. I think if you go back in history far enough, you will find that almost every single group is guilty of some sort of sin. And so I'm not totally sure that letting an emotion like guilt drive how you use history to justify certain policy decisions is the most effective and emotionally regulated way to do that. That's why we need to have what I call repression awareness. See, when we repress feelings, particularly feelings that come up when we're learning history, they might show up in unexpected ways. For example, it's probably not advisable that the country of Italy makes all of its policy decisions based on the guilt from the things that happened underneath the rule of Mussolini. They can acknowledge that history, they can both and it, to go back to one of the other skills that I've talked about in this series, and actually use that knowledge to make the best informed decision that they can. So again, just to recap, your feelings are not wrong. Do not suppress them because if you suppress them, they may come up in other unexpected ways. I believe it was Freud who said that if you bury your emotions, they will arise from the dead like ghosts in other forms. Really a lot about what I'm talking about here is something called emotional reasoning. And so emotional reasoning is basically when you're feeling an emotion and then you take that emotion and then you kind of misapply it onto a different subject. A basic example of emotional reasoning is if I'm having a really bad day at work and I think I'm gonna get fired, I might go to my therapist that week and I might say, you know, I don't think my marriage is doing well. I've been feeling so down about so many things. In reality, my marriage might be doing fine. It actually, I, I'm misapplying the reasoning. I'm misapplying the emotional reasoning there. One way this happens when people learn about history is they learn about the horrors in concentration camps and that can be incredibly dysregulating. I mean, there's the Jewish concentration camps in Nazi Germany. There's been Muslim camps, um, Japanese internment camps in America. There's obviously like the Russian gulag History is not short on concentration camps where millions and millions of people have died and and learning about that and learning about how you know th th these are people these are people with, like just like you and me that committed these things and some of them weren't even alive like that long ago like some of them were alive in our lifetime or your parents lifetime or your grandparents lifetime and when you're learning about history like that and and if the emotions are really really intense one of the things that you can do is you can distract yourself with the five senses i'm going to walk you through what i mean it's actually a dbt skill a dialectical behavioral therapy skill and basically what you want to do is you want to rate the level of distress and then you want to stimulate your five senses that are corresponding with that level of distress. So let's say I'm learning about something in history and my level of stress is about a three or four out of 10. Well, then I wanna stimulate my five senses about a three or four out of 10. So I might make a really strong cup of tea and I might put my hands on the hot glass, that's feel, um, and I might smell the tea, how pungent it is, that smell, and I might taste, I might let it seep for a really long time, and that's taste, and um, I might listen to some music, 
and I might um, go for a walk, change my environment. Basically, you want to get out of your head and into your five senses because oftentimes where emotional pain, where anxiety lives, it's in the mind, it's in your nervous system. And so by activating other parts of your nervous system, like the five senses, you can regulate your emotions so you can avoid falling into the trap of emotional reasoning. Now, let's say you're learning about politics, a current event, and the news article you read really freaks you out. And it's like an eight or nine out of 10. Well, then you need to stimulate your senses in that way. And so what I would do is I would actually take an ice cold shower. I would actually bite into something like a lemon or something very pungent. And I would listen to music, maybe not music that I enjoy, but something that really gets me out of my head, like, 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 screamo or metal music no judgment to anyone that loves that music but that that's too stimulating for me that's not necessarily my go-to and when i stimulate my senses in that way i can actually break up all the connections that my nervous system is making while i'm really really distressed about whatever news article it was that i read and then i can go back to it and i can decide how i want to proceed the truth is a lot of people use distraction with the five senses all the time and they do it because it works and often it's very, very intuitive. But when we're really, really distressed, when we're really emotionally dysregulated, when we're caught in the throes of emotional reasoning, we are not always conscious that we can affect our system so easily and so effectively. Sometimes when we're learning about a tragic event and we're experiencing emotional overwhelm, we don't need to get into our five senses. Sometimes we just need to take a second and we actually just need to accept whatever it is that we're learning. And oftentimes in history and politics, this is much easier said than done. For example, people will dismiss modern manifestations of anti-Semitism because Jewish people today occupy different positions of power. So they think, well, how can they actually be oppressed? Or maybe people get really dysregulated. A lot of people were seriously dysregulated when Trump won the election. And a lot of people spent a lot of time talking about how it actually can't be the case. Some people were in denial, just like a lot of people are in denial today about anti-Semitism. And just like a lot of people are in denial about stuff that happens in the Middle East, just like some people are in denial about how homophobia still exists in the United States, people have a hard time accepting things because, well, I know why. It's really easy to understand why. They're heartbreaking. It is much better, emotionally speaking, to live in a world, even a world that is colored by your fantasy, that these things don't exist. But when evidence is presented to the contrary, it can be a real shock to your system. And one of the things that you want to do is you want to practice something called radical acceptance. This is another DBT skill. And the idea of radical acceptance is exactly as it sounds. It's you radically accept the thing in front of you. And it's not that you accept it because you don't want to change or you don't want to do something about it. It's that you accept it because oftentimes what happens is that when people are refusing to accept it, that is why they're in such emotional distress. And then that emotional distress is going to lead to black and white thinking. It's going to lead to ideological possession and rigidity because your mind want, is spending all this energy on emotions. It doesn't want to actually spend energy being flexible. It's going to lead to all of these problems that I've been giving you tools for. So sometimes in order to know what tool is best, you actually just have to accept the problem in front of you. And sometimes that can be really, really scary. And I completely acknowledge that. But I know one thing for sure, you will feel more empowered, like you can do something, even something small, even if it's something that feels out of your control, once you accept the facts as they are. A lot of people don't like to look at politics or history as if they could be the perpetrator, but I actually think that the truth is, is that if you were in Germany in during World War II in, in the 30s, that chances are you would have been a Nazi. I mean, just statistically, more people were complicit with the Nazi regime than were not. I mean, the same goes with the gulags in Russia, and the same goes with all sorts of different examples. And in order to understand history and understand what it has to teach us about the human condition, about what it has to teach us psychologically, about how our minds work, we have to have deep compassion and empathy for these people. And I think oftentimes people find it easier to have compassion and empathy for 
the victim, for the person in the concentration camp, for the casualty of the war, for the dying women and children. And I think it's important to have empathy and compassion for those people when learning about history or any of the victims of today's tragic world events. But I also think it's important, if you're going to be a real student of history, to actually have empathy and compassion for the perpetrator, not because you want to excuse their behavior, but because you want to get really related to what was it that made them tick? How did they possibly get there? And you want to do this because you want to make sure that this never happens to you. Some of you may have seen in my writings or some of my other videos, I often talk about the differences between empathy and compassion. See, in empathy, we're a self-centered perspective. We put ourselves in the other person's shoes. We think about what it would be like for us to be doing that. And that can be very, very difficult to do if you're trying to have empathy for a Nazi or for someone who is sending people off to the gulags or to a soldier who was burning and pillaging villages or whatever the example is. Compassion is a little different. Compassion is it's other centered. So you consider what it was like for them in their situation, but you remain healthily detached. It's my contention that compassion, as I've defined it, is a better way to look at history because it's not as dysregulating. You want to tap into your historical empathy when you really, really need to. And when you have the emotional space for it, I mean, we all have lives. We all have romantic troubles, job troubles, family troubles. And there not, not every day is going to be a day in which you can actually tap into historical empathy, particularly for the perspective of a perpetrator who you find detestable. <music> Lastly, I want to talk about being too logical or too emotional. There are lots of political and historical issues where this comes up. One timeless debate that we have here in the United States and other parts of the world is the abortion debate. And one of the things that I notice in the abortion debate is that people often approach it with pure emotion or pure logic. So I'll give you some examples. People that are against having access to abortion will cite things like, you're killing babies and you just want to have sex without consequences you are so disgusting, you are Satan, like they, they say like all these things, it's like very, very emotional. But on the other side of it, people also get very, very emotional. They say things like, you just wanna control women, you hate women, you don't want what's good for society or the economy, et cetera, et cetera. And that brings me to the overly logical arguments. People will say, well, the studies show that when women have access to different kinds of contraception and access to abortion, economies do better because women have more agency and that is good for society and that's good for culture. Uh, but then people on the other side of it will say things like, yeah, well, if a pregnant woman gets stabbed by a murderer, do you want the murderer charged for one murder or two murders? You know, very, very logical argument. And really what both sides are doing when they separate logic from their emotions is they're not practicing something called wise mind. This is the skill I want to talk to you about here. Wise mind is a DBT skill where you actually put your logic and your emotions together. Since this is the last skill of this series, and since I promised you it would be the spiciest, I will go ahead and let you know how I think wise mind applies to the abortion debate. And frankly, I think that even if you are someone who's pro-life, you have to acknowledge that a lot of people don't view it that way. And if we're going to live in a pluralistic society, some people are going to exercise their right to do this. And I think that a lot of European countries actually just make it accessible in the first trimester. And then they kind of just call it a day. And typically, this is an issue in which it is so emotional that people do not want to hear about a middle of the road kind of centrist approach. And I'm not even trying to convince you of my centrist approach on this issue. I'm just trying to highlight for you how when you're talking about this issue, particularly with someone who disagrees with you, you're going to notice, I promise, you're going to notice that they're not in wise mind. They're in emotion mind or they're in logic mind. And unless they can bring those together, and unless you can bring them together, there's probably very little likelihood of you moving forward in that conversation in a productive way. If you have any ideas for any other skills or tools or any other contentious historical or political issues you feel like I did not tackle, why don't you tell me in the comments below and I'm happy to make follow-up videos using those examples or diving into those topics because I'm here to make content for you all and 
I really hope it was helpful. And like all my content, whether it's current event related or political related or purely psychologically related, I make all of it so you are empowered with knowledge to navigate your life with a little bit more sophistication. And I hope I accomplished that today. Thanks for watching.